All right, guys, so good morning. Um, we're gonna start talking about the principles of cell theory to begin. All right, so <clears throat> the principles of cell theory. So one of the most important um, ideas in biology, so biology is just the study of um, living things, was cell theory. So cell theory has, has been a widely accepted explanation for the relationship between cells and living things. So according to these theory, there's three main things that you have to understand, okay? So all living things are made up of cells. Extremely simple. You just gotta know everything that's living has some sort of cells, whether it's one or trillions. It is depends on the organism, but just know that it's made up of cells. Now, cells are also the basic units of structure and function in every single living thing, and that new cells are produced from existing cells. So cells are just not made out of nowhere. Instead, they are made from pre-existing cells that are already in your body. They just um, replicate, and we are gonna get into that later on um, when we talk about mitosis for cells. So even though most living things differ greatly because from one another, they're made up of more cells. Cells are the basic units of life. Most cells are extremely small, but many um, can be surprisingly large. So the cell theory holds true for all living things, no matter how big or small they are. Organisms can be made up of one cell or many cells, like I just said. We can study how one cell organisms remove waste to sustain life. Then we can use this information to understand how multicellular organisms carry out the same task. And because all of these cells are produced from existing cells, scientists can study cells to learn about growth and reproduction. So we focus on these one cell organisms like the one we have right here, because from this is where we can take all the information we know and carry that over to multicellular organisms. Because now we understand these small little organisms, what they're capable of, what the organelles can do. Organelles include the vacuole, the mitochondria, um, the ER, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, things like that. So these Organ organelles in these one-celled organisms are going to be able to tell us how these multicellular organisms um, work and how their cells are being able to reproduce. All right, so microscopes. Microscopes have been very, very important in the scientific community in addition to um, medicine in general for doctors and things like that because they are able to magnify small images and focus um, on a very particular aspect of it. So the cell theory could not have been developed without microscopes. The microscopes we use today have the same function as those that were used 200 or more years ago to view tiny specimen. Um, the advanced technology in the modern microscope, though, provides far greater detail for how much closer of observation we can view now. So light microscopes focus light through lenses to produce a magnified image. Electron microscopes are a lot more complex. To create the image, an electron microscope uses beams of electrons that scan the surface of the specimen. So if we are looking at it, this would be an electron microscope, one right here. Now, this one is going to be our, um, what's it called? Sorry, sorry. This is our light microscope, and this is our electron microscope. These are going to be a lot more um, complex. Now, if you see right over here, as you can see, it is a spider, but it's extremely close up, so we can see all the little hairs on it. We can see um, the legs very clearly, the the, um, the mouth up here. So it just allows you to see things extremely close up. So both types of microscopes do the same job, just in different ways. They both rely on two main factors though, on magnification and resolution. So magnification is just the way a compound microscope is set up. So this setup includes two lenses at once. So one of them is gonna be called the objective, which is located on the revolving nose piece. A compound microscope usually has more than one objective lens. Um, each objective lens has a different magnifying power. By turning the nose piece, you select the lens with the magnifying power you need. A glass rectangle 
called a slide holds a thin sample to be viewed. A light shines up and passes through the slide and the sample. The light then passes through the lens in the nose piece and the eyepiece lens. Each lens magnifies the sample. Finally, the light reaches your eye and you get to see the sample in detail. So for example, this, when you put this little slide right here, okay, that is where you're going to put your specimen. So whatever you want to see, you're going to put it on this um, glass slide. Most of the time you have a lens cover. So you put usually like your specimen, a drop of um, filtered water, you put the cover on it, and then you put it under your um, microscope. Now, you have these revolving um, lenses. So each lens has a different magnification. So um, you can go to 100 times bigger, 200, 300, 500. It kind of just depends on the type of microscope it is. Um, it depends on how fancy it is. Um, and it has this mirror back up here that is going to be reflecting this beam of light that it's going to go through up here it's going to go through the specimen itself and then it's going to go all the way up into your eye you're going to be putting your eye right up here all right so resolution so a microscope image is useful when it helps you see the detail of the objects clearly so the higher the resolution of an image the better you can distinguish two separate structures that are close together for example Better resolution shows more detail. In general, for light microscopes, resolution improves as magnification increases. So electron microscopes provide images with great resolution, um, and higher magnification makes it relatively easy to study these tiny objects. So if you're looking at, this is a fly. This is the same fly. It's just, a magnif or, um, it is magnified a little bit um, more in depth so you can see all of these tiny little eyes okay so um, just make sure you understand that you can distinguish very different structures that are close together so I can tell that this is the eye right I can tell that this part of face I can tell that this is um, somewhere where they eat and then right over here I can definitely tell the individual parts of this eye so I want you to think about a couple of things though. So um, think about what are the three main ideas of the cell theory. Make sure you understand why the cell theory was so important and how it related to the invention of the microscope. Okay, why did people want to study this? Um, so now we're going to move on to our next um, standard. This standard is going to be recognizing and exploring how these cells and organisms undergo these similar processes to maintain homeostasis, um, including extracting energy from food, getting rid of waste, and reproducing. So we are now going to be on, if you have your textbook, we're going to be moving on to lesson three, topic eight, which is on page 370 to 376. If you do not have it, it is okay. I will always post enough information on here for you to be able to do your work. All right, so um, think about an evening, you're walking in near your home, you spy something moving around on the ground. So you, first off, you think of it's a black or white cat. As you move close to her, you to get a better look. The animal fluffs up and raises its tail. It's a skunk. So you hurry it up around and go to the other direction. You know that if you get sprayed by a skunk, though, people are going to be able to smell and stink from far away. Um, Odor molecules are going to be traveling through the air and inhaled where everyone's around you. So cells are going to be relying on the movement of the surrounding gases, liquids, and particles to supply them with nutrients and materials. So in order to, for cells to live and function, cells must be let certain materials enter and leave. So oxygen and water, for example, and particles of food must be able to get into the cell while waste materials must be able to move out. Some of the same mechanisms that let materials in and out of a cell also let those skunk spray uh, molecules, the chemical makeup of odor, seep into the specialized cells into your nose and perceive the smell. So pretty much it's just saying that cells need to be able to carry out their functions. So they have to be able to allow certain things in. 
just like they said, uh, oxygen, water, and food has to be required to move into a cell while waste materials are going to be carried out. So waste materials can be um, like anything that's going to harm the cell per se, per se is going to be um, getting out of it because if not, then the cell is going to um, be endangered. So every cell is surrounded by a cell membrane that lets cell systems in and out. So this movement allows the cell to maintain this homeostasis. So homeostasis is just a very stable in, internal environment that gets all the chemicals needed to support the cell's life. You can see that the different types of molecules play important roles in helping materials move across the cell membrane. So if you look here at this image, you have the intracellular space, which is inside the cell, and then you have this extracellular space, which is outside the cell. This would be your cell membrane. So you have all of these types of channels that are gonna be allowing certain materials to get by. So for example, this one is gonna be allowing proteins in, okay? We have these also. So it's going to whatever, these little proteins, anything that wants to get in the cell, it kind of depends based on shape and how they're able to fit into these spots. So for example, this one has like an oval shape, okay? So if it detects an oval coming in, it's gonna open this um, channel up and it's gonna allow that material to come inside the cell. Now, same thing over here, we have a circle, for example, that's going to be coming into this channel and it's going to be allowed in because of that specific shape. Okay, now most of the time there is, um, for example, viruses, bacteria, things like that, they're going to try to be getting into these cells and they're actually able to trick these uh, channels in order to open them and let them in. Okay, so that's another issue. So a, a, a um, permeable membrane means that liquids and gases are able to pass through it. So some materials move freely across the cell membrane, others move less freely or not at all. The cell membrane is to be called selectively permeable then, okay, which means that more substances can cross the membrane while others cannot. So substances that move into and out of the cell do so by means of one or two processes, passive or active transport. So selectively permeable means that only certain things can be um, coming into the cell while others cannot. So think of it as selectively, right? They are able to select what can come through and what cannot. And then on the other hand, we have this permeable membrane that allows pretty much anything that can be easily flowing in and out of the cell. So I'm actually going to pause here for today because I want you guys to really think about what we've uh, talked about, what um, cells mean, what are they, where do they hold um, value to our daily lives. In addition, we're starting to think about how cells work. So what can get in and out of the cell, um, how does it maintain this homeostasis environment where it's able to have this stable internal environment so it still um, has the ability to have enough energy and get waste out and able to function. So I'll be posting this one moto like I have. Please make sure to refer to the questions that I posted yesterday um, to get the questions that you need for the discussion and the lesson check questions that are going to be due by the end of the week. Thank you.